right, so today I'm going to continue reading Maniac McGee by Jerry Spinelli. And um, I just wanted to refresh your memory on what happened in the last two chapters that you should have read or watched and read along with um, yesterday, chapter nine and chapter 10. So in chapter nine, John McNabb, who was not able to strike out Maniac, in fact, he hit the first fast frog in field home run ever against John McNabb, um, is looking for him. And he finds him with his gang or his group of friends called the Cobras. And um, John McNabb is white. So he is on the West End and they chase Maniac or Jeffrey all the way to the border between the West End and the East End, which is Hector Street. It, and so as um, white kids, they won't cross that border, but Jeffrey does and keeps going past it. And so they um, kind of just stand back and laugh because they know from stories that have been told to them, or I'm making an inference here, but they um, know that bad things will probably happen to him um, as a white kid over on the East End of town. So in chapter 10, um, that does kind of happen. He runs into a character named Mars Bar, and Mars Bar is frequently eating a candy bar, which is why he has the nickname of Mars Bar. And he asks, Jeffrey asks Mars Bar where Sycamore Street is because he realizes that he's on the East End and he might be able to find Amanda's house. He knows Amanda's house is, is on the East End. He, he recognizes some of the roads he's um, passing. And so as they're kind of having an altercation in the road, a, an argument in the road there, um, he's taunting, Mars Bar is taunting Jeffrey and kind of making fun of him. And he um, dares him to take a bite out of his candy bar, which he does. And that makes Mars Bar very angry. Um, and so he takes Amanda's book from Jeffrey. And in the scuffle, in the um, fight between the two of them, or to get him back, one of the pages gets ripped out of Amanda's book. Um, when this happens, uh, there's a lady that lives on the street where they are and she comes out and, and stops it and kind of breaks it up and, and gets, um, Mars Bar to give the page back to, to Jeffrey. But of course it's ripped and it's been crumpled. And, um, so it's not in good shape to give it back to Amanda. So he's a little upset about that, but he does, she does break up the fight and, um, Mars Bar goes off one way and she tells Jeffrey that he should probably leave and get out of um, the East End and go back to the West End where he belongs. So we are gonna be reading chapters 11 through 14 today. And as we read, um, or after we read chapters 11 through 14, there are some vocabulary and comprehension questions that go along with these four chapters. I have went through and highlighted and I'm gonna put this in the instructions as well, highlighted um, the things that you might need to refer back to when you're answering some of the questions or when you're doing the vocabulary. So I wanted to give you my color coding key so you would understand how I color code, how I highlighted things or why I highlighted things in different colors. So if you see here the bluish purple word uh, prospects on toward the bottom of um, this page, um, in the beginning of chapter 11, that is a vocabulary word. So all the vocabulary words that I was able to find, I highlighted in blue or purple. Um, there was one I wasn't able to find. We'll see if I can find it as I, as I read through with you right now. Um, it was the word solemnly that we need to find. So I'll look for it. And if I find it, I will highlight it in blue as well. Sometimes you'll see some words highlighted in this pinkish color. Those are, um, there's one part of your assignment that you have to say who said certain quotes within the book. So those are the quotes that you need to say um, the character who was saying those particular words. Another thing that you'll see or another color that you'll see with highlighting is this orangish color here. There is um, a part where you have to say the effect of a certain um, cause in the book and um, this is the effect and you have to 
write what the cause is, what, ha what made that happen? Why did this certain thing like Mars bars, his eyes going as big as headlights, why did that occur? Okay, so all of those are gonna be highlighted, cause and effect are gonna be highlighted in orange, words are gonna be highlighted in blue, and quotes are gonna be highlighted in pink. There is one that actually the same words refer, have two different answers. One is a quote and one is a cause and effect. So I highlighted part of it pink, part of it orange to kind of help you see um, the different parts of it there so you can find your answers. Okay, so chapter 11. Now what? Maniac uncrumpled the page, flattened it out as best he could. How could he return the book to Amanda in this condition? He couldn't, but he had to. It was hers. Judging from that morning, she was pretty finicky about her books. What would make her matter? To not get the book back at all? Or to get it back with a page ripped out? Maniac cringed at both prospects. He wandered around the East End, jogging slowly, in no hurry now to find 728 Sycamore Street. He was passing a vacant lot when he heard an all-too-familiar voice. Hey, fish belly. He stopped, turned. This time, Mars Bar wasn't alone. A handful of other kids trailed him down the sidewalk. Maniac waited. Coming up to him, Mars Bar said, Where are you running, boy? Nowhere. You running from us? You afraid? No, I just like to run. You want to run? Mars Bar grinned. Go ahead. We'll give you a head start. Maniac grinned back. No, thanks. Mars Bar held out his hand. Give me my book. Maniac shook his head. Mars Bar glared. Give me it. Maniac shook his head. Mars Bar reached for it. Maniac pulled away. They moved in on him now. They backed him up. Some high schoolers were playing basketball up the street, but they weren't noticing. And there wasn't a broom swinging lady in sight. Maniac felt a hardness against his back. Suddenly his world was very small and very simple. A brick wall behind him, a row of scowling faces in front of him. He clutched the book with both hands. The faces were closing in. A voice called, that you, Jeffrey? The faces parted. At the curb was a girl on a bike. Amanda. She hoisted the bike to the sidewalk and walked it over. She looked at the book at the torn page. Who ripped my book? Mars Bar pointed at Maniac. He did. Amanda knew better. You ripped my book. Mars Bar's eyes went as big as headlights. I did not. You did, you lie. I didn't. You did. She let the bike fall to Maniac. She grabbed the book and started kicking Mars Bar in his beloved sneakers. I got a little brother and a little sister that cran all over my books, and I got a dog that eats them and poops on them, and just inside my own family, and I'm not going to have nobody else messing with my books. You understand? By then, Mars Bar was hauling up the street past the basketball players who were rolling on the asphalt with laughter. Amanda took the torn page from Maniac. To her, it was a broken wing of a bird, a pet out in the rain. She turned misty eyes to Maniac. It's one of my favorite pages. Maniac smiled. We can fix it. The way he said it, she believed. Want to come to my house, she said. Sure, he said. Chapter 12. When they walked in, Amanda's mother, mother was busy with her usual tools, a yellow plastic bucket and a sponge. She was scrubbing purple crayon off the TV screen. Mom, said Amanda, this is Jeffrey, she whispered. What's your last name? He whispered, McGee. She said, McGee. Mrs. Beale held up a hand, hold it. She went on scrubbing. When she finally finished, she straightened up, turned and said, now what? Mom, this is Jeffrey McGee, you know. Amanda was hardly finished when Maniac zipped across the room and stuck out his hand. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Mrs. Beale. Mrs. Beale. They shook hands. Mrs. Beale smiled. So you're the book boy, she started nodding. M Amanda came home one day. Mom, there's a boy I loaned out one of my books to. Loaned a book? You? Mom, he practically made me. He really likes books. I met him on... 
Mom, Amanda screeched, I never said all that. Mrs. Beale nodded solemnly. Well, there's that word I was looking for. It's in this quote. Oops. Sorry, it made the whole thing. I'll go back and fix that. No, of course you didn't. It gave Maniac a huge wink, which made Amanda screech even louder until something crashed in the kitchen. Mrs. Beale ran. Amanda and Maniac ran. The scene in the kitchen stopped them cold. One little girl, eyes wide, standing on a countertop. One little boy, eyes wide, standing just below her on a chair. One shattered glass jar and some stringy, pale-colored glop on the floor. One growing cloud of sauerkraut fumes. I'm going to share with you what sauerkraut is because it's probably not, it might not be a word you're familiar with. It is a type of cabbage that is brined or pickled um, in vinegar and other spices. And so it's, it's, it's like a salad and usually it's served cold and um, it could become, it could come in jars. All right. I just wanted to show you, I fixed that. Um, so this is the part you need for cause and effect. And then solemnly is the word that you need for the vocabulary. All right. So, the twins, or the one little boy and one little girl, are standing on a countertop with sauerkraut on the floor and a glass shattered. The girl was Hester, age four. The boy was Lester, age three. In less than five minutes, while Mrs. Beale and Amanda cleaned up the floor, Hester and Lester and their dog, Bow Wow, were in the backyard wrestling and tickling and jumping and just generally going wild with their new buddy and victim, Maniac McGee. Maniac was still there when Mr. Beale came home from a Saturday shift at the tire factory. He was there for dinner when Hester and Lester pushed their chairs alongside his. He was there to help Amanda mend her torn book. He was there watching TV afterward with Hester riding one knee and Lester the other. He was there when Hester and Lester came screaming down the stairs with a book. Amanda screaming even louder after them, the kids shoving the book and themselves onto Maniac's lap, Amanda finally calming down because they didn't want to crayon the book, they only wanted Maniac to read. And so he read Lyle, Lyle, Crocodile to Hester and Lester, and even though they pretended not to listen to Amanda and Mr. and Mrs. Beale. And he was there when Hester and Lester were herded upstairs to bed and Mrs. Beale said, don't you think it's about time you're heading home, Jeffrey? Your parents will be wondering. So Maniac wanted to say something, but not knowing how, got into the car for Mr. Beale to drive him home. And then he made his mistake. He waited for only two or three blocks to go before saying to Mr. Beale, this is it. Mr. Beale stopped, but he didn't let Maniac out of the car. He looked at him funny. Mr. Beale knew what his passenger apparently didn't. East End was East End and West End was West End. And the houses this white lad was pointing to was filled with black people, just like every other house on up to Hector Street. Mr. Beale pointed this out to Maniac. Maniac's lips started to quiver. And right there with the car idling in the middle of the street, Maniac told him, that he didn't really have a home, unless you counted the deer shed at the zoo. Mr. Beale made a U-turn right there and headed back. Only Mrs. Beale was still downstairs when they walked into the house. She listened to no more than 10 seconds worth of Mr. Beale's explanation before saying to Maniac, you're staying here. Not long after, Maniac was lying in Amanda's bed, having been carried over to Hester and Lester's room, where she often slept anyway. Before Maniac could go to sleep, however, there was something he had to do. He flipped off the covers and went downstairs. Before the puzzled faces of Mr. and Mrs. Beale, he opened the front door and looked at the three cast iron digits nailed to the door frame. Seven, two, eight. He kept staring at them, smiling. Then he closed the door, said a cheerful, good night, and went back to bed. Maniac McGee finally had an address. Chapter 13. Amanda was happy to give up her room to Maniac. It gave her an excuse to sleep with Hester and Lester every night. Most of the time during the day, the little ones drove her crazy. She couldn't stand to be in the same hemisphere with them. But at night, the best thing was to have them snuggled up on both sides of her. It made no sense, but that's how it was. 
Mr. Beale divided the little one's room into two sections with a panel of plywood and Amanda moved her stuff into the back part, except for her suitcase of books. That stayed in her old room with Maniac. The way Maniac fit in, you would have thought he was born there. He played with the little ones and read them stories and taught them things. He took Bow Wow out for runs and he did the dishes without anybody asking, which made Amanda feel guilty, so she started to dry. He carried out the trash, mowed the grass, cleaned up his own spills, turned out lights, put the cap back on the toothpaste tube, flushed the toilet, and Mrs. Beale called it the miracle on Sycamore Street. He kept his room neat. Every morning, Mrs. Beale looked into it. No socks on the floor, no drawers open, no messed up bed. That was the most amazing thing, the bed. It looked as if it hadn't even been slept in, which she soon found out was the case. Late one night, she opened the door and found Maniac sleeping on the floor. She lugged him back onto the bed, and by the next night, he was back on the floor. Maniac just couldn't stand being too comfortable. Lying on a mattress gave him a weird feeling of slowly rising on a scoop of mashed potatoes. He was that way with chairs, too. If he had a choice, he usually sat on the floor. Other strange things happened in the house, such as the yellow bucket and sponge spent more time gathering dust in the cellar and less time in Mrs. Beale's hands. Because with Maniac around, Hester and Lester lost their interest in crayoning everything in sight. And therefore, sometimes for 15 minutes in a row, Mrs. Beale was seen doing something she hadn't done since the little ones were born. Nothing. Such as Amanda started leaving her suitcase of books home. Such as everybody's fingertips started to heal because Maniac took over the endless thankless job of untying Hester and Lester's sneaker knots. Such as Hester and Lester starting to enjoy taking a bath which was the solution to a very huge problem in the Beale household. Once upon a time, Hester and Lester loved getting a bath to get a bath as long as Amanda got one with them. It was a little crowded, especially when the little ones added their boats and floating dinosaurs, but it was fun and warm and yelpy and soapy. Then came the day when Amanda entered fourth grade. She decided she was getting too old to tub it with her little brother and sister. They begged her and begged her, but she wouldn't get in. They tried to storm the bathroom when she was in there, but she locked the door on them. And so the little ones went on strike. They placed their hands on Lyle Lyle Crocodile and swore they would never take another bath until Amanda joined them. And even though they couldn't stop their much larger mother from lifting them up, and plunking them into the water, they could refuse to touch the soap or washcloth. They could make her do it. And they could sit there all stiff with their chins down in their chests and their arms folded tightly and their legs clamped together. And if their mother wanted to wash their armpits, she would have to get a crowbar and pry their arms up because they sure as heck were not gonna move. That's the way it was for a long time until Maniac arrived. On that first Sunday, as soon as the little ones found out that their new pal had slept over, they mobbed him. Jeffrey, Jeffrey, get a bath with us, will ya? Maniac replied, sure, okay, not thinking much about it. After all, it was still before breakfast, but the little ones never let up, and at exactly 9.15 a.m., the three of them got into the tub. By the time they got out, it was too late to go to church and almost lunchtime. From then on, the baths usually took place at night. Sometimes Mrs. Beale would poke her head in and stare, one little black girl, one little black boy, one medium white boy, and she would smile and wag her head and sigh. Never saw such a tub. The time she heard Hester and Lester yelling for help, though, she was downstairs. She came running, what's the matter? The little ones pointed, look. She looked, Maniac was covered with blotches round red blotches all shiny from the bath water they looked something like little pepperonis they took him to the doctor 
the doctor took a look at it and said it wasn't chicken pox, it wasn't the measles. He said it might be an allergy. He asked what the boy had had for dinner. Mrs. Beale answered, pizza. Well, the doctor chuckled, can't be that. Can you imagine a youngster getting sick on pizza? Everybody laughed. Besides, said the doctor, this would have shown up on him since he was little. Most likely every time he came near a pizza. He turned to Maniac, still chuckling. You have eaten pizza before, haven't you? Maniac got a funny expression on his face. He looked around. Everybody was staring at him. The silence grew longer. Eyes grew wider. And that's how they found out that Maniac was allergic to pizza. Chapter 14. Maniac loved his new life. He loved his new sneakers, the one Mrs. Beale bought for him. He loved the new quietness of his footsteps as he trotted Bow Wow through the early morning streets. He loved the early morning, the before the working people time, he called it, when even those who went to work the earliest were still sleeping behind their second story shades, when it seemed as if the whole world had been created just before he woke up on his bedroom floor. The red brick rows of houses, even the windows resting from faces, the cool, silent sidewalks and streets, so quiet you could hear the water running far below the sewer grates, while the sun shinied up the rain spouts. He loved the silence and solitude. But he also loved the noise, which came later in the day. He loved the sound of pancake batter hiss, hissing on the griddle. He loved the noise of the church they went to on Sunday mornings, a church called Bethany, when the minister would thump on the pulpit and the people would call out, Amen, and the choir would swing this way and swing that way, and they would sing, Hallelujah, to the people, and the people would sing, Hallelujah, right back to the choir. And everyone just got happier and happier, and it all made him want to do more than run. So one day he just jumped himself up onto the pew bench and threw his arms to the sky and shouted at the top of his lungs, hallelujah, amen. And this time nobody looked funny at the crazy kid yelling by himself. Then two members of his own family, Hester and Lester, jumped onto the bench with him and shouted, hallelujah, amen. And everybody laughed and clapped and sang. He loved the 4th of July block party when the whole East End converged for a day and night of games and music and grilled chicken and ribs and sweet potato pie and dancing until the last firecracker and then some. Maniac loved the colors of the East End, the people colors. For the life of him, he couldn't figure out why these East Enders called themselves black. He kept looking and looking, and the colors he found were ginger snap and light fudge and dark fudge and acorn and butter rum and cinnamon and burnt orange, but never licorice, which to him was real black. He especially loved the warm brown of Mrs. Beale's thumb as it appeared from under the creamy white icing that she allowed him to lick away when she was frosting his favorite cake. He loved joining all the colors at the vacant lot and playing the summer days away, stickball, basketball, football, half the time he forgot to go home for lunch. One day a new kid, tall and lean, came to the vacant lot spinning a football. He spotted Maniac and stopped cold. He came closer, bent over, stared, then he broke out in a billboard grin and called out, hey everybody, remember I said about that little white dude snatched the pass off me in gym class? Here he is, this is a dude. And this, of course, was hands down. The first thing hands did when they chose up sides was to pick Maniac for his team. You crazy hands, a high schooler laughed. He's just a runt. His peach fuzz ain't even come in yet. Everybody laughed. But hands took him anyway and played quarterback and threw passes to Maniac all day long. They huddled and scratched their plays in the dirt. Down to the tin can and break for the goal. Stop and go at the rock curl around the junk tire. If Hans Pass was anywhere near Maniac, if Maniac could get at least two fingertips on it, the ball was as good as caught. 
The high schoolers and junior hires went crazy trying to stop him. Nobody kept official records that day, but legend has it that by the time Amanda Beal show, showed up and called, Jeffrey, dinner, Maniac had scored 49 TDs. And when they played stickball and they saw him pulling the ball out to the street and into backyards, they started putting two and two together. And somebody came up to him and squinted in his face and said, you that maniac kid? Somebody else said, you that maniac? And pretty soon everybody was saying it, including Hester and Lester. And finally in the kitchen one day, as he licked white icing from her thumb, Mrs. Beale said, you that maniac? He told her what he told everyone. I'm Jeffrey, you know me. Because he was afraid of losing his name and with it the only thing he had left from his mother and father. Mrs. Beale smiled. Yeah, I know you all right. You'll be nothing but Jeffrey in here, but she nodded to the door. Out there, I don't know. She was right, of course, inside his house, a kid gets one name, but on the other side of the door, it's whatever the rest of the world wants to call him. All right, that takes us to the end of chapter 14. You have um, today, Wednesday, and tomorrow, Thursday, to complete your assignment, which is the vocabulary and the comprehension that I showed you as we went along. Have a great day.